hello, and welcome to this online Lowy Institute panel discussion. Uh, my name is Roland Rada, and I'm the lead economist at the Lowy Institute and the director of its newly established Indo-Pacific Development Centre. Before we begin, as we are based in Sydney, Australia, let me take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which some of us are joining from here today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today, we are discussing the ongoing debt crisis in Sri Lanka and what might be the way out for the country. Numerous developing countries around the world are grappling with severe debt problems, but Sri Lanka's crisis has been amongst the most acute and visceral, triggering significant social unrest and political un upheaval. The crisis is ongoing and yet to be resolved. So I'm glad to say that we have assembled an excellent panel of experts to step through all the issues involved. First is Dr. Indrajit Kumaraswamy. Dr. Kumaraswamy is one of Sri Lanka's most respected and experienced economists and former policymakers, most recently serving as the governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka from 2016 to 2019. Next, we have Brad Setzer of the Council on Foreign Relations based in New York. Brad is one of the world's most prolific, but also insightful commentators on international economic issues and a guru on sovereign debt issues in particular. So it's great to have him with us as well. And finally, we have my colleague, Marisa Fure. Marisa is a research fellow in the Lowy Institute's Indo-Pacific Development Center, and among other things, has previously worked as a macroeconomist with the World Bank covering Sri Lanka and the Maldives. So Marisa, Brad, and Dr. Kumaraswamy, welcome, and thank you for being here. Uh, Marisa, if we could uh, start with you to, to kick us off, just what's the basic story of the crisis playing out uh, in Sri Lanka, at least your version of what's going on, and you know what's the, the current state of play? Thanks, Roland. Um, well, you know, Sri Lanka's growth trajectory and um, overall debt trajectory is a very interesting and complicated story. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll just summarize what's happened in the last um, two decades or so very quickly. But um, Sri Lanka graduated as a lower middle income country in 1997 and uh, then became an upper middle income country in 2019. Um, between those to sort of that between that window, basically, uh, Sri Lanka's concessional financing, um, you know, obviously uh, went away largely, and Sri Lanka had to borrow in the private capital markets uh, and also at higher interest rates with uh, bilateral creditors. Um, so uh, we, you know, in the background, obviously, we have the 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 war, um, the conflict. Uh, that began in the 80s and, um, you know, uh, sort of ended in 20, uh, 20, 2009 with, um, uh, in May 2009. Uh, so, you know, a lot of us actually lived through that conflict. Um, one of the things that Sri Lanka started doing after the war is to aggressively expand on its um, uh, infrastructure by uh, borrowing and um, you know, there are those that say that, um, you know, some of these white elephant projects are sort of what uh, led to uh, Sri Lanka's uh, debt crisis. Um, uh, but, you know, in, in, in rea the reality is that even though Sri Lanka became a upper middle income country in 2019, uh, in July 2019, um, you know, they, they haven't really seen much of the gains. Uh, and, you know, some say that, you know, they are sort of stuck in a, in a middle income, uh, trap, so to speak. Um, following, I mean, you know, there was a East, there was a, we would call it the Easter bomb, but there was a bomb in, in April 2019. And, um, you know, a lot of, um, sort of people, uh, sort of speculate that that uh, led to um, the election of the Rajapaksa sort of coming in. Uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa was elected in November 2019. Um, and, um, you know, with, and then 2020, of course, was a, was a very difficult year with the pandemic. And uh, Sri Lanka really, you know, struggled like a lot of other countries. Um, Sri Lanka's debt crisis really, you know, Sri Lanka should have gone to the IMF by 2019 because there were 
visible signs of this debt distress from 2019. Um, you know, they had issues uh, making repayments on ISPs, and I think the central bank had to sort of um, uh, play a supporting role in that. Um, 2021, Sri Lanka was uh, trying very, very hard to, to continue to service debt at all, uh, you know, despite all odds, and at the expense of, of essential social and um, human development spending. And then we have uh, 2022, which was arguably the most fraught and difficult year for, for a lot of Sri Lankans, uh, for all, all of Sri Lanka, uh, politically, economically, um, people um, had uh, to face, you know, very long uh, power cuts, poor shortages, people were unable to go to work, uh, which, you know, obviously poor shortages led to uh, no public transportation in some, some months or very little tra public transportation. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, in April 2022, uh, Sri Lanka basically began its debt moratorium. And that's when the, the news media internationally sort of uh, picked up and, you know, then Sri Lanka sort of became uh, one of the first countries in South Asia to, to actually um, default on its debt. And, um, and so that was sort of, uh, sort of in, in recent history. And so that was sort of, uh, I would say, uh, that made the headlines. And, um, you know, despite all, so, so I think people were sort of uh, protesting from March 2022, uh, but th that those protests gained momentum, you know, because there was a sense of dissatisfaction with the with the regime, um, and you know, people were you know hungry. That there was you know, um, food, food was you know, food prices had gone up, inflation were at record highs, and um, and so uh, basically, I think uh, we have. Uh, the June and July were protests were very very difficult. The prime minister um, resigned. Uh, that was uh, the president's brother. He resigned, and then um, you have sort of uh, the protests taking taking over to such an extent that it sort of became a revolution in in, in a in a in a strong sense of the word. And in in August twenty uh, twenty. Two, uh, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa um, sort of um, uh, fled the country, um, and uh, then shortly, uh, shortly after that, we have um, a, a kind of a veteran politician and uh, veteran uh, prime minister elected as the president, uh, Mr. Ranil Wickremesinghe, and. Um, Ever since then, you know, there obviously was then an overt push to get in the get in the IMF, even though it was a delayed reaction. It was still very much the only option that Sri Lanka had, and um, and then you know in, in the in the IMF, uh, I think they started their discussions uh, sort of in the third quarter of last year, and then we got um, board approval for uh, for the EFF um, in. I think March, March of this year. And so far, Sri Lanka has been tracking very well. Um, and of course, I think later in the discussion, we can talk about um, some of the preconditions um, and some of the structural benchmarks that Sri Lanka will be, you know, uh, working towards. But so far, Sri Lanka is doing very well in terms of meeting the IMF conditionality. Um, yeah, I think I think that's 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 fair to say um, that you know there are still quite a lot of risks. Um, I think the the key risk is really uh, the local elections are you know they uh, are keep getting postponed, and uh, and I think there's a lot of concern from from uh, from uh, NGOs and also from from Sri Lankans that. Uh, um, that the rule of law and, and democracy, uh, you know, need to be upheld even in a in a extreme crisis such as this. Um, so um, I think there's definitely concern that um, 
the elections are postponed. I think the reason is that, um, you know, there's obviously, it's it's expensive to have an election. It's expensive to, to print ballot papers, et cetera. So, um, so I think that's probably why it's been postponed indefinitely. Um, but um, but as I said before, Sri Lanka is tracking very well. Oh, thank you, uh, Marisa, just for, for bringing us uh, up to date in terms of, of what's happening and, and, you know, and flagging that, you know, it's a debt crisis, but it's also a humanitarian, a social and, and deeply a, a, a political crisis as well. Um, Dr. Krimaraswamy, if I, if I can turn to you, um, just to sort of give your version of how Sri Lanka has come to this point. I mean, obviously, you've been involved in policy making in Sri Lanka for a very long time as you know, observer, commentator, con contributor. Um, you know, how, how is it that Sri Lanka has, has come to the, the position that it's in? What do you see as the underlying drivers? Thank you, Roland, for having me. <clears throat> Let me say that um, if one is to talk about the genesis of the multiple crises that Sri Lanka is currently confronted with, it's instructive to separate the causes between those which are historical and those that are proximate in terms of coming into being in the last couple of years. The historical causes really are the reasons why Sri Lanka has been a twin deficit country for decades. Um, um, you know, at the time of independence, Sri Lanka was second to Japan in Asia on many indicators, but we've regressed a great deal. And a major cause for that regression has been consistent macroeconomic stress, repeating cycles of macroeconomic stress. And that is reflected in the fact that the Sri Lanka has had 16 IMF programs before the current one. And we've never really been able to get the structural reforms done to pull the country onto a different growth trajectory. We've, been we've had stop growth policies around a series of IMF programs for many years. And the main cause of the macroeconomic stress has been the government's fiscal operations. And the unsustainable fiscal operations have been amplified by fiscal forbearance in monetary policy. And then you had the exchange rate being used to contain inflation, there's a very high import component in Sri Lanka's uh, import um, basket. Uh, and so these essential imports tend to go up in prices as soon as you depreciate the currency. So in order to combat that, governments tended to run overvalued exchange rates. So that's another kind of mismanagement of the macroeconomic policy framework. So we had mismanaged fiscal policies, mismanage monetary policies, and often mismanage exchange rate policies. So macroeconomic management or macroeconomic mismanagement has been a primary cause of the stress that the economy has been going through in repeating cycles. So finally, you know, how did Sri Lanka last for such a long time, 75 years since independence? Uh, where, in fact, Professor Joan Robinson from Cambridge, who was certainly no neoliberal, as you know, she was an expert on China uh, way back in the 50s and 60s. She came to Sri Lanka in 1959 and said famously, you Sulanese, it was still on then, you Sulanese have eaten the fruit before you planted the tree. And that's basically, I think that's a very good depiction of what happened in Sri Lanka. But we were able to get away with it. You know, how, how did Sri Lanka go on for so long with this kind of macroeconomic misalignment that uh, they existed for a long time. And that was because of those countries that went down the dirigis route, the inward looking route, Sri Lanka was the second country after Chile to liberalize its economy in 1977. Now, Chile at that time was under General Pinochet. So the traditional donors were very keen to have a country which had a liberal economy and a liberal polity and to show good, demonstrate good development outcomes in that country. So they were extremely generous to us in terms of concessional assistance. We were a low-income country then. The World Bank's um, IDA, uh, the Asian Development Bank's Asian Development Fund gave us a lot of concessional money. The bilateral donors gave us generous amounts of concessional money. So we were able to live beyond our means and really not take the tough measures necessary to put our house in order. But that this all went on, as Marisa said, 
went on okay until we graduated from low income country status. Yeah, around 2010 is when it really began to make a change. And then uh, once we became exposed to rating agencies and international capital markets, we could no longer basically behave in the way we did in the past. But that did not percolate through to the policymakers, to the politicians in particular. And we continued to behave in the same old way until we got hit very badly. Um, you know, of course, the, the, the problem was building up all the time and where it, it kind of spilled over with the proximate causes, which, was, which were the pandemic, the, uh, uh, which was beyond our control, as is the um, impact of the, of the Ukraine-Russia war on commodity prices, et cetera. But there were also some major policy mistakes, including a very large scale cutting of taxes at the end of 2019, as well as a banning of chemical fertilizer which had a major impact on Sri Lanka's agriculture. And the cultivation of the, uh, the, the uh, rice, uh, which is basically the basic food item in the country, as well as our major exports like tea. So if you, it's a combination of policy mistakes and exogenous uh, shocks coming through from the pandemic and the, uh, and the war has meant that, you know, there was a kind of a perfect storm which hit Sri Lanka. And then we had the kind of multiple crisis that you spoke about, basically, essentially, debt, foreign exchange, social, uh, all, all at once. But as again, Marisa ended by saying, Sri Lanka has got an IMF program. Uh, and that program, there was an IMF team in uh, Colombo last week, and they were pretty satisfied with the way the program is progressing at the moment. And their um, debt restructuring is being negotiated with the bilateral and commercial creditors. And that is also making progress. Hopefully, uh, well, we should get a deal done in the next month or two. Thank you. But you know, there's still a lot of hard work to do, particularly to put the country on a, on a recovery and growth path. Thank you. Uh, th thank you for that, Dr. Kumaraswamy. Um, it's very, it's very interesting. I think um, to separate those historical and the and the proximate um, causes, the persistent twin deficits, and then a set of policy missteps that made those twin deficits far worse. Exactly when a bunch of very large shocks were coming through on on the external on the external side. I mean, it's um it's also noteworthy what you say about um, the role of the international community in financing um, Sri Lanka historically in in terms of. Um, you know, I guess the incentives for reform that that ultimately seems to have set up in the story that you tell. And and now, as you know, um, you know, the new source of external financing has been has been China. Um, theoretically, they, that, that's, they, they say that comes with no strings attached in terms of at least econ an economic policy settings. Um, but obviously, it's attracted a lot of attention and, 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 um, and debate. I just wonder if I can, can I draw you on that? What's China's role being in in the genesis question for this of this crisis? Well, in my view, the narrative that Sri Lanka got caught up in a Chinese debt trap uh, does not stand up to much scrutiny in the sense that total chi Chinese debt counts for about 10% of our total external debt, which is just a little less than what Japan, we owe Japan, and certainly less than what we owe the World Bank and the Asian, Asian Development Bank. Um, the, the terms are somewhat um, more tighter as far as the uh, borrowing from China are concerned, but much of it is still on concessional terms, not as concessional as the multilateral money and some of the bilateral money, but it's still on fairly concessional terms. So it's, it's unfair to say that the Chinese, uh, that, that there is some kind of Chinese debt, debt trap which Sri Lanka fell into. But it is fair to say that the quality of the projects that the Chinese loans financed did not earn or save enough foreign exchange to service that debt. So to some extent, the fault has to be on us and the Sri Lankan side, because we did not screen the projects well enough to make sure that they would provide us a sufficiently high return to be able to sustain that debt. And also we allowed political considerations to drive the, the loan uh, giving, uh, both on our side and 
and China, I guess, also played along with it. Uh, and that that is where the real problem is, that the co poor quality projects um, and probably also uh, quite a lot of corruption around those projects um, where both sides benefited from the from the corruption. Uh, all that, you know, was a pretty toxic mix, but you can't put the debt crisis down to that, uh, really, because as I said, the debt crisis has a long genesis, and then we've had a number of exogenous factors plus policy missteps that all came together to cause the debt crisis. But the, the, the Chinese debt, as I said, real, real problem is the quality of the lending. Um, we and the Chinese, I think, need to learn lessons in terms of making sure that projects that are financed by these loans uh, make, uh, can generate sufficient returns for the country to be able to service for them. Uh, th th thank you for that. Um, Brad, can I bring you in here? Um, any comments on what uh, Dr. Kumaraswamy and, and Marisa have already said? Um, but also, I know, you know you're one of the few people that's really into the weeds of, of the whole debt restructuring process. So your views also on, on how that seems to be going. Uh, sure, well, I, I uh, agree with much of what has been uh, said so far. I certainly would uh, also point to the large tax cuts in 2019 as an important uh, immediate cause of the crisis. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka was looking pretty bad on a range of debt indicators uh, when the pandemic struck. Um, and I also would highlight uh, that the quality of China's project lending wasn't uh, what it should be uh, for various reasons. Um, but, you know, you look at the numbers and that's five billion of Sri Lanka's debt. Uh, international bonds are 13 and Sri Lanka also. Um, you know, benefited in the short run from being able to access bonds when the bond market, when uh, rates were low for long in the advanced economies, when investors were looking for yield, uh, but what didn't put itself in a strong position to handle the risk that came with that surge in lending. Uh, and you really just can't rely on the international bond market, cut taxes, and go through several years when you're collecting 10% of GDP and revenues, less than 10% of GDP and revenues, when your fiscal deficits were over 10% of GDP. I mean, those kind of numbers to scream unsustainability. What I would add though a little bit is that uh, you know, in 2020 and again in 2021, uh, the China Development Bank came in with a, a sizable, not enormous fiscal support loan uh, that prolonged uh, Sri Lanka's uh, effort to keep paying and dug Sri Lanka in my view into a bigger hole. And so I do fault uh, both Sri Lanka and China for not biting the bullet uh, back in 2020 or certainly in early 2021, when it was clear, clear that Sri Lanka was not in a position to repay all of its international bonds in full and on time. It took out loans from China to basically pay back the bonds, to pay back some of the loans to China uh, and uh, really depleted almost entirely Sri Lanka's foreign exchange reserves in the process. And that left Sri Lanka in a, in a horrible position when it ran out of money in 2022. It really had to rely on uh, on squeezing the Sri Lankan people uh, and uh, help from India at that time. Happy if Dr. Uh, Kromoswami wants to jump in. No, no, but when he wants to finish, Brad. Um, so now, I mean, uh, you know, Sri Lanka did strike relatively quickly a deal with the IMF. Uh, it took a long time to go from the deal with the IMF to actual IMF lending because of some difficulties, I think, securing uh, financing assurances from China. Uh, that's been a fairly typical problem, actually, for countries that fall into default on both their bonds and on the Chinese project and uh, more fiscal lending. Zambia also had to wait a long uh, period of time. Uh, but China did finally give its consent, allowed the IMF program to go forward. And I think my main concern right now is a little bit less uh, on whether Sri Lanka is delivering on its uh, commitments, it seems to be, uh, but a little bit more 
on uh, what I think the uh, IMF didn't do sufficiently, which is to set out parameters for the debt restructuring that actually require real concessions from the creditors. Uh, the actual constraints on Sri Lanka are, uh, are, are, gener are not that tight, not that binding in comparison to the constraints on uh, say Zambia or some of the other cases. Uh, the debt to GDP criteria is 95% debt to GDP, which is quite high for a low in, lower middle income country, a country with this level, with this history of, of fiscal deficits and, and lack of revenue. Um, and the constraint on foreign currency debt service, which wasn't an, uh, a constraint on the actual interest you can pay, it was a much looser constraint because of way, the way it was defined uh, is 4.5% of GDP. If that's all structured as an interest payment and doesn't include a pay down of principal, that's also a pretty hefty uh, burden. So I worry a little bit that Sri Lanka is not being set up to succeed uh, because it's it may emerge with more debt than it can sustain, even if it meets the IMS criteria. We can discuss why, but I do think that is an important uh, unresolved question. Why did the IMF uh, provide relatively undemanding to the creditors uh, criteria. But I think there's also a puzzle because the criteria don't seem all that demanding. And yet it still took six months to get China's uh, financing assurances. So I think there's uh, to a degree, uh, a generalized difficulty uh, getting agreement uh, from a more diverse set of creditors, even when there's a debate about whether creditors are being asked to do all that much. Mm. Yeah, it's, it certainly seems that the the parameters that have been proposed by the IMF package don't leave much in terms of a safety buffer, right? In, in near term or in, indeed maybe in the long term, if they're whether given the targets that have been that have been that have been set. Uh, Dr. Kumar Swami, though, you wanted to come in on on something. Yes, not really to basically uh, reinforce what Brad said about the delay in going to the IMF. <clears throat> Because back in 2021, I think it was about April or May, Sri Lanka applied for assistance under the IMF's Rapid Finance Initiative. I think over 90 countries were assisted through that facility that was initiated to support countries at the time of the pandemic. But that support did not come, and there was no real explanation given by the country or the IMF. But the reason was, I suspect, is because the IMF decided at that time itself that Sri Lanka's debt was unsustainable. And therefore, once the country's debt is deemed unsustainable, they're not able to transact with the country. So it was clear that, that there was a problem. So we would have known from that time there was an issue on the debt side. So to wait for two years, or pretty much two years after that, clearly compounded the problem. Uh, so that, that's, that's one, one thing I think that Brad was very right. We could have gone much earlier. And that could have meant that the uh, problem would have been a far lesser problem uh, to resolve. But because of the pre-existing vulnerabilities and the COVID and uh, the other factors, we probably would have had to restructure our debt anyway. Uh, but it would not have been quite as uh, onerous as it is now. As to whether Sri Lanka's, the, the parameters the IMF has set are too light or not, I know it's interesting that something like 59 or 60 percent of the countries that go in for a debt restructuring end up having to go again. Um, so I certainly hope Sri Lanka is not in that category. But one one thing one thing that perhaps could work in our favor, I say, ah, in Sri Lanka's favor, is the growth assumptions in the IMF uh, projections. They basically project contraction of three percent this year. Uh, then very low growth next year, and then 3% growth over the subsequent five, six years of the 10-year uh, time span. The Sri Lankan economy has the capacity to grow faster than that. It's, uh, if, if we get do the stabilization right and do some of the structural reforms, and also given what's happening in India in the neighborhood and the kind of opportunities that are likely to come up for us to be piggyback on to some of that, we can grow at four or five percent. So as you know, once the growth number is comes out better than 
anticipated in the IMF program, that makes a very big difference to the sustainability. All the, all the, all the uh, uh, matrices kind of change uh, in a positive direction. Mm. Uh, that's a very good point uh, to make. Marisa, I might bring you in on this now, looking, looking forward, right, in terms of, you know, the way out of the current situation and, and the adequacy of what we're seeing. I mean, as Dr. Kumaraswamy says, um, you know, you need the, the debt restructuring, you need the stabilization, you need better fiscal macro settings, but then also you need to generate economic growth. So there's actually, there are, there are a number of components to the, the, the set of policies and requirements to get out of this crisis. What's your view on, on the package and, and the, the, the sort of strategy that's currently on the table? Do you think it provides that kind of basis? Thanks, Roland. Look, it certainly provides a basis, uh, but I think the government still needs to have a cohesive strategy in terms of how it takes the IMF conditionality and how it takes, how it views its growth in the medium term and, and what it plans to do in terms of growth centric reform. And I think the package certainly is a stabilization package, right? It's not, it's, it's not going to mean that Sri Lanka doesn't go to the IMF again. Um, and, you know, like Brad rightly said, uh, the performance criteria is relatively um, undemanding, right? Uh, so I think that's that's definitely there. But the only comment I would have to add there is that there, you know, the, the, the level of political instability. And I think also when IMF was, um, you know, initially uh, sort of doing its appraisal, um, there was also a lot of social instability and, and that's still ongoing, but not at the level that it was last year, right? Um, so in terms of the package itself, the, you know, preconditions as well as the, the quantitative criteria and stru structural benchmarks are all, I think, pretty fair. Um, I think there are risks, though, um, that the uh, government may not be, um, um, you know, consistently uh, committing to, 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 to um, all of the uh, reforms. Uh, my concern is really on the um, Central Bank Act. Uh, you know, the, that needs to be um, debated uh, in parliament and approved in parliament uh, and it needs to get go from the par par parliament and, and that's not happened as yet. I think the discussion on that was delayed. Uh, so I think that's one of the uh, conditions that have not been met as yet. Uh, the other thing is that uh, from the point of Sri Lankans, there's still, uh, there's a lot more information than there was, uh, you know, say yeah, on on uh, what Sri Lanka is doing actively to meet the IMF uh, conditionalities. But uh, there's still um, relatively some unknowns, you know, and I think uh, particularly on the monetary side and also on the fiscal side. Um, there's still a lot of uh, room for improvement. And I think uh, Sri Lanka is going to start, um, you know, there, there are commitments to obviously improve the level of transparency in terms of information sharing on, on how Sri Lanka is meeting uh, its conditionalities on the EFF. So um, it's a work in progress. But I think on the EFF itself, it's it's quite fair. Uh, and I think um, the only thing I would add is that um, there are so many unknowns in terms of the political and social space of the of the country that there, and also uh, there's really no margin of error because there's no there are really no buffers, right? Uh, as such, so if there's a natural disaster or something. Um, you know, um, I guess the IFIs would have to sort of swoop in to, to, to support Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka really doesn't have the ability to be able to defend itself in a 
in an emergency, so to speak. Mm. Um, uh, very, very good. Do Dr. Krimaraswamy, I wanted to sort of ask you to, to uh, specifically on the, um, the reform side of the equation rather than the, the debt restructuring side of the equation. I mean, I think many of these reforms have been things that either have been talked about or, or recognized for some time. Um, so what is the, you know, what will this time be different, so to speak? Um, you know, what's the chance of success on the reform front in your view? What will it take? And and the other element is that the, the deeper structural reforms, um, governance and, and, and in terms of generating economic growth, from my reading, that seems to be something that has sort of been said largely we'll, we'll, we'll specify that we'll specify that later, we'll work that out later, that's still to come. Um, but any views on what that needs that needs to do as well, what, what needs to be in the mix there? So, uh, yeah, as um, Marisa has said, that the stabilization program has <coughs> you know, gone pretty well. You know, we are seeing inflation coming down, interest rates are coming down, the exchange rate has been appreciating, um, but it's important to point out though the stabilization has been very positive, that it has been done at a lower level of equilibrium. It was done when the economy shrank by 8% last year, and it's, it's projected to shrink 3% this year. So it, it's not difficult, I, don't, I mean, it's not easy, but it's easier to stabilize if you're you know, stabilizing at a much lower equilibrium. So what we need to do is to have stabilization when the economy is going three, four, five percent. So that's where we need to get. And that cannot be done through, you know, uh, tightening monetary policy, uh, tightening fiscal policy, adjusting the exchange rate. I mean, it's helpful, but you really need to have these structural reforms that are going to strengthen the growth framework in the economy. And we've talked about those for many years, but have not really, you know, been able to implement them. Because for instance, the investment climate, the, uh, the, the investment promotion needs to be more focused. The trade policy, trade agreements need to be worked on. In fact, now the president is saying that we are we're setting ourselves two kind of benchmarks. One is RCEP and the other is the, 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 the successor to the TPP that, that, that he wants to make sure that the reforms are embedded by us working to join those two trade agreements. Now, if that is possible, if we achieve that, that would be transformative. But there's a long way to go to get there. So trade policy is another area, education, training, and skills development. So the whole, really the whole spectrum of the development challenge needs to be worked on to make sure that the country gets up to a higher level of, of uh, growth on a sustained basis. Now, what is concerning is that in the previous IMF programs, while we managed to do the stabilization quite well for a period of time, then you know the electoral cycle would come to an end, and as elections approached, even the stabilization you know fell apart. Um, but the structural stuff never really got done. They, you, the payoff usually takes more than one electoral cycle, and you know politicians don't see it in their interest. Do tough things to improve the, the you know the structure of the economy. This time around, if we don't do it, we are going to be stuck in this low level equilibrium. And if we keep, if the economy keeps contracting, the social problems are likely to exacerbate and exacerbate very seriously. So that has to be done. And my fear, the, the risk to all this is because elections are approaching next year. Historically, when elections approach, we have real, real falling away of discipline. So that is what we have to avoid this time. That risk is there. The politicians need to be focused on doing it all very differently this time. I hope that message has got through. Brad, did you want to come in on, on any of that um, in terms of the, the structural reform side of the equation? Maybe less the structural reforms and more just to reinforce that, you know, the IMF program, like all IMF programs, assumes that Sri Lanka will meet its primary surplus uh, requirements. And you can view that assumption uh, as very uh, optimistic. In reality, uh, there's some possibilities of slippage there. 
Um, and that's a, that is a real challenge, as, as uh, Dr. Kumasari says, highlighted. Uh, Sri Lanka doesn't have a history of sustaining primary surpluses over time. Uh, I think that, you know, I personally prefer to have an IMF program not be built around a growth miracle. Um, a lot of times pro, uh, debt restructurings fail, programs fail because there's uh, an excess of embedded optimism. Uh, so having a more realistic growth baseline that implicitly assumes some kind of future shock, so you're not always growing at your full potential, doesn't, uh, I think that's that's prudent. Uh, but there is this underlying risk that with this high level of debt, uh, uh, Sri Lanka has no choice but to maintain a, uh, a primary surplus over time. And that's not something that is uh, that one would say is consistently demonstrated in Sri Lanka's past history. Mm. Um, no, that's a very good point. And I think um, not only growth but and the and the surplus and settings, but um, the, the IMF program is, is premised on quite significant revenue raising, not just reversing tax cuts, but revenue administration, which is, you know, obviously much more complex and, and, and uncertain. Um, and maybe not wise to, to strictly bet on for the success of debt restructuring, as you say, Brad. Um, maybe, Brad, we can stick with you. I mean, just turning back to the debt restructuring side of things, I, I think all three of you have said that things seem to be going reasonably well. But um, obviously, that, and that is the central central element of this crisis and, and, and the way out. What are the, do you see that there could be potential roadblocks? What are the things that people need to watch? What are the, what are the issues that are going to need to be overcome? Some that come to, to mind uh, to me is that there's a significant amount of domestic debt rather than external debt. And so how that gets treated in the debt restructuring is, is complex. Um, a lot of domestic um, um, holders of that debt that would take a hit. Um, private, on the private sector, um, there's been some positive signs from the private sector bondholders, but there are many that didn't sign the letter that said that they were willing to play ball on, on debt relief. And so is there might be some holdouts. I wonder if there's um, you know, what your views are on the risks of that. And then I still think, as I understand it, China's role is still not is still not clear um, that the China Exim Bank, Export Import Bank, has provided its assurances to participate in debt relief, and that still you know will be part of an ongoing negotiation. But the China Development Bank, that also has important disclosures uh, uh, exposures, is um, is, is is considered at this point one of the private sector creditors, um, and so that's obviously a complicated issue. Brad, and what do you see anyway as the sort of potential roadblocks from here in terms of the debt restructuring? Well, uh, I think the the IMF program parameters uh, provide the backdrop for all these different uh, debt restructurings. Uh, on one level because the overall debt constraint is set at a pretty high level, uh, less is being asked of all creditors, which should uh, facilitate agreement. Uh, but because uh, Sri Lanka is not a low income country, uh, the, the way the parameters have been written leaves uh, more room for flexibility and interpretation, uh, which in some sense creates more opportunities to pit different uh, groups of creditors against each other. Uh, I personally would have rather had an independent constraint on external debt service, the net present value of external debt, rather than have that embedded in an overall debt constraint. So in theory, more debt relief from the domestic side would allow more scope to pay uh, a bigger uh, uh, yield, a future, more future payments to private creditors. I actually don't think there's that much more that Sri Lanka can get out of its domestic creditors. Uh, there have been suggestions around debt optimization processes. The ones that make sense are, are uh, designed to reduce your gross financing need, which is the technical parameter in the program, probably by using uh, floating rate uh, bonds, which don't have a big haircut and uh, can be accommodated on the local bank's balance sheet but really hitting bonds held on the local banking system never generates sustained, in my view, gains to debt sustainability. You, you lose on the banking side anything you think you gain. So I hope that the there's a recognition that there this shouldn't be an obstacle to moving forward. On the official creditor side, uh, 
again, because Sri Lanka is not a low income country, it doesn't technically fall within the common framework. So there's actually two official creditors committees, uh, one which is the Paris Club in India, another which is China, which in this case is mostly China XM. I don't think uh, either the Paris Club, which is mostly Japan or China, will actually have to take a, a really significant uh, haircut. The, even the concessional coupon that is implied by the IMF program, it's a little concessional, but it's not that concessional. So I would hope that there isn't a roadblock there, uh, but we don't yet have an example of a of the terms that XM will accept, and they are uh, in the first tier of the restructuring process. With respect to the bonds, the bonds are priced to be restructured. They traded into the twenties for a while. They're maybe what in the thirties, but they haven't really rallied. There, there's an embedded expectation that there will be a bit of debt relief. Uh, and I hope that creditors recognize that. I hope Sri Lanka recognizes that. And I hope everyone can get to agreement. There's a hold that risk, but there's also a broader risk, which is that uh, the, the bondholders uh, get too greedy, frankly, when they look at the IMF's program parameters and they try to uh, optimize their cash flows consistent with the IMF program parameters. Uh, and that uh, leaves too big a gap between the Sri Lankan government and the creditors to get to a deal. Uh, so I, I worry that either Sri Lanka will give in and go up to that, or the bondholders were asked for too much, and that either way it may take longer than people uh, hope to get a deal with the bondholders. But assuming that there is a deal that is done that is consistent with current market pricing, uh, there is a coordination challenge with holdouts. Uh, there are multiple bond issues. Some of them have older bond restructuring language. Uh, but I th also think that if Sri Lanka is well advised legally, uh, there are ways to make uh, reduce the risk of holdouts. Use the contractual provisions that you have. Uh, there's some technical things that make it harder after you do a restructuring for the holdouts to successfully sue to block payment on the new bonds. Do those things. And I actually think that if you can get a deal with the critical mass of the bondholders, there's no reason why you couldn't get uh, uh, very high levels of participation and uh, minimize the holdout risk. So I, of the various risk out there, that's probably the one I worry about the least. Mm. Um, Dr. Kumaraswamy, anything you want to add on what are on the potential roadblocks or, or what Brad has said? Yeah, no, I very much um, agree with what uh, Brad has said. Um, and I think on the holdout, so far there's only been one, that's the Hamilton Reserve Bank, um, which has a 25% a holding on one of the international sovereign bonds. And there's a court case going on in New York, um, which is still ongoing. Uh, but the, the government's legal advisors uh, have uh, are reasonably confident that they can hold that off. Uh, uh, and, and I think Brad is absolutely right. There is a deal to be had. Uh, in the sense that uh, within the parameters set out by the IMF, um, the I think the bilateral deal I've already the I think the contours of it has been have been has been shared with the Paris Club and India and China. Uh, so hopefully negotiations can start fairly soon. And on the commercial um, creditor side, also so far uh, there is a creditor group which has been making very constructive noises so far and all the major players are in that group. So hopefully progress can be made on that front too. Uh, the, the slight complication is that China is not part of the common platform uh, of, the, of Paris Club plus India. Uh, so there may have to be two separate negotiations with the Paris Club plus India on the one hand and China on the other hand. And then one would need to make sure that the outcomes are comparable and transparent. So one needs to work to the same outcomes on both sets of negotiations. So it's not an insoluble problem, but it makes it a little bit more complicated. Yeah, I mean, and just the, to add the, to that on sure, the private sure. side, there's also two restructurings because you have to do the restructuring with the bonds. And then because yeah. China Development Bank's fiscal financing Correct. is considered private, you're, so you're going to have four separate negotiations. Not yeah, an insurmountable yes. okay. problem, but... But it's a but it does add a layer of complexity. Yeah. yeah, complication. Yes, absolutely right. And I, I think 
so far, it's been progressing quite well. I think the next, you know, where there is some sensitivity at the moment is on the domestic debt. Uh, it seems that it's not possible to do the deal without some treatment of domestic debt. The, the government is very determined not to touch the banking system if it can possibly avoid it. Because as, uh, uh, you know, it's pointed out, it, it's absolutely, you know, a financial crisis on top of everything else that we have. Uh, you know, Brad's absolutely right. Hey, that would be disastrous right now. So, uh, but there are some low hanging fruit. The central bank holds two thirds of the treasury bills. So that can be, I think, treated without too much difficulty by converting those into long-term bonds. Uh, and it, there may be some scope, uh, the superannuation funds are being talked about, but that's politically very sensitive, of course, uh, to have any kind of treatment of, of, the, of the holdings by those uh, funds. Uh, so there, there is a bit of an issue to be handled there, uh, because it seems that some domestic uh, debt treatment is necessary. And I'm, I'm, my understanding is that Central Bank has made some recommendations to the government, and hopefully it will now move forward. Uh, because the other elements are actually, you know, far more doable. Uh, the domestic debt is a bit sensitive. Mm. Well, I mean, it sounds like there's, you know, a little bit of hope, if you will, on the uh, restructuring side of things. Although going back to the earlier point in our conversation, the, uh, the, the, the as, as Brad put it, the requirements are a bit, um, soft, so to speak. I'm not sure if you've said soft, but nonetheless, the requirements are a bit soft, and and so that's make that makes the task um, somewhat easier. Um, I'm conscious of, of time, though, in terms of of this conversation. So what I might do is just give the three of you a sort of an opportunity to sort of provide some last words, your final sort of overall um, take um, in terms of you know what you think. Um, needs to happen, but and what do you think the lessons coming out of this crisis so far are, both for Sri Lanka, but also in terms of you know this is an, a global debt crisis affecting many other emerging and developing economies. Um, you know what could be what are the lessons potentially as well um, for the international community from all of this. Um, Brad, maybe if we we start with you, if that's okay. Uh, sure. So I would uh, probably highlight uh, three lessons. Uh, the first lesson is, uh, which is, I think generally applicable, Sri Lanka will be the the example that people point to for the cost of delay. Uh, there, it was very clear well before Sri Lanka defaulted that it needed to seek a restructuring, that it shouldn't be paying its debts, and that it needed to conserve its reserves. And by essentially waiting until there was nothing left other than the, the Chinese swap, which wasn't usable, Sri Lanka guaranteed this deep contraction, this 10% loss of GDP. So it guaranteed a bad outcome. Uh, so the lesson number one is the cost of delay. I think lesson number two is, uh, is important and it's sort of almost obvious, uh, but you can't support high levels of debt with low levels of revenue. Uh, when tax revenue fell to 10% of GDP, a crisis was almost certain. Uh, emerging in low-income countries uh, could only support that or only have high levels of debt and low levels of revenue if all their debt is concessional. If it's market debt or even Chinese project lending, which has a, a meaningful amortization profile, you just can't sustain uh, high levels of debt with low levels of revenue. Uh, and I think that's, that's not an architecture observation, that's an eternal observation. The third uh, uh, issue, I think it's a real issue for the international community, is how do you set debt restructuring targets that both help you get to deals when you have a complex set of creditors that includes China, that includes market commercial bondholders, and that also uh, provides a path to sustainability with a high probability. Getting a deal that doesn't give you uh, a sustainable debt structure isn't a great outcome. Uh, not getting a deal is not a great outcome. And I do worry that there are such a large divergence, uh, just in technical terms, but also in terms of what is being asked of various creditors, between what is being asked in some of the low-income country cases, 
and what is being asked under the market access debt sustainability framework. So to me, one of the lessons is thinking about what criteria move the negotiations forward in a constructive way, but also in a way that generates sustainability uh, and that doesn't generate wild inconsistencies across uh, relatively similar countries that differ only slightly in their income levels. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's um, very difficult, but many will, will be watching Sri Lanka's um, situation and and the arbitrary distinction, as, as you say, between being uh, not outside of the, the standard common framework and the, the low income uh, approach to, to debt sustainability, but still having so many vulnerabilities at the end of the day and, and very low, low revenue. Um, Marisa, maybe if we can bring you in at this point, what your final sort of words on this on the situation and, and the way forward? Yeah, I think uh, Brad covered off the lessons really, really well. And I think um, really, um, I guess I worry about the downside risks in terms of other um, exogenous shocks, be it, uh, I mean, a, a natural disaster or something else, uh, given the that, you know, there are basically no buffers as such. Um, I think my key message really is on, on fiscal discipline uh, and also uh, investment project appraisal, improving those uh, processes. Uh, on fiscal discipline, um, sort of, I um, think in the early 2000s, there was a FRA Act to, um, and there were some um, fiscal operational fiscal rules um, that were not really adhered to. Uh, I think this time around, this is an opportunity for the government to, to introduce realistic fiscal targets, fiscal rules, um, have them sort of, um, you know, in a legislative, you know, package them within the legislation and, um, you know, have sort of leaner escape clauses. Uh, that's that's the one message. The second is um, for the government to continue to work. I mean, um, Dr. Kumaraswamy has pointed out that some of these growth-centric reforms, uh, reforms on uh, in relation to the BOI and uh, improving FDI um, flows, etc. Um, these these reforms have been in the works for years, right? Um, having a one-stop shop for investors, et cetera. Uh, but um, really, um, Sri Lanka also needs to think in the background, apart from meeting these the policy conditionalities, apart from um, pushing towards um, a constructive dialogue and, you know, sort of refraining or from holdouts and getting getting a deal. I mean, get, cutting the deal, that's that's as Brad said. And then third is to, in the background, to really think about uh, sort of sustainable growth, a sustainable growth path, going from non-tradable uh, growth to tradable growth um, and what, what, what that would entail, right? Um, given that the crisis, I mean, when you have a debt crisis and these kind of multiple crises, what happens is uh, that non-tradable growth obviously then gets squeezed out. Um, and one more point to add is really um, on, on uh, strengthening and, and having a targeted strategy on reducing income inequality. And I think uh, Sri Lanka is making headway with uh, improving um, SSN transfers uh, by introducing the Asvasima program, et cetera. But more needs to be done um, I think the IMF package does have uh, great conditionalities on um, imposing uh, wealth and in inheritance taxes, but more needs to be done to to ensure that um, sort of the richest, the one percent, so to speak, are paying their fair share of dues in terms of um, uh, revenue. Mm. Okay, thank you for that, Marisa. Dr. Kumaraswamy, I'll give give the last words to you. Okay, I think uh, one point I must make, and I should have made earlier, is that you know income poverty has doubled in the last year or two. So we need to strengthen our social safety net. 
Our cash transfer programs need to be beefed up. The government has plans to do so. So that has to be implemented and it has to be implemented in a transparent way. And hopefully by using technologies, a lot of the leakages that have been there in the past can be addressed and it can be targeted better. So one is a much stronger, a better targeted and more effective social safety. The second thing is, I think I would really want to endorse what Brad said about a timely approach to the IMF. If you're running into difficulty, the, if you get, there, get in there early, the problem becomes a far less, uh, far less complex and far less burdensome to handle. Uh, and uh, that is one lesson that needs to be really um, to be absorbed. The other point I'd like to make is that, uh, you know, the uh, uh, you must have buffers in your economy. One of the things that the East Asians learned uh, after the East Asian crisis is that you need to build buffers. You need to build a fiscal buffer. And the East Asians built insurance in terms of their external reserves. So those kinds of buffers need to be built in to the macroeconomic framework. And the third related macroeconomic point is that, as I kept saying and at the beginning, uh, macroeconomic stress has been our big problem, right? Repeating cycles of macroeconomic stress. So we need to have very clear frameworks for macroeconomic policymaking. So inflation targeting is what the new central bank bill has. And you need to have these frameworks and embed them in the law. So you have flexible inflation targeting, uh, and you also stop the central bank by law from being able to participate in the primary auction for treasury bills, so that you can't have this unlimited deficit financing that the central bank has been undertaking recently. You also have to make sure that you have certain fiscal rules. We have a Fiscal Management Responsibility Act, but the rules are very weak. We need to strengthen the rules, and I believe that's being done in the new kind of fiscal laws that are coming in. So have clear frame and, and the exchange rate in, in a flexible inflation targeting framework, the exchange rate has to be your first line of defense. So you have to manage it flexibly. So you have to have these clear frameworks and wherever possible, embed them in law. Then the final point I'd like to make is that SOE reform. The SOEs have been a massive burden on, on the exchequer and a lot of their losses are sitting on the state bank balance sheets, undermining their viability. So really we need to have a significant major SOE reform program, divestment where, where possible and necessary and um, operational uh, autonomy and efficiency uh, where that is uh, the better for chosen ob uh, objective. So uh, all in all, I think, one thing we have not been able to do, as I've said, is to do fiscal, do stabilization and structural reforms at the same time. This time around, we have to do that. You've got to do that concurrently. It's not a sequential exercise. If we want to get growth going quickly enough to, to head off any social uh, instability, uh, and which are, uh, automatically will translate into political instability, we need to get this done quickly and effectively. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Kumaraswamy. Those are some excellent points um, for us for us to end on. I think my takeaway is that you know the the debt restructuring that is being put forward it's going reasonably well, uh, in part because of the requirements of the creditors as the bar has not been set too high. In turn, that that does leave Sri Lanka vulnerable, and it also means that a lot of the emphasis. I'm taking away from your comments in particular, and Dr. Kumaraswamy and Marisa, a lot of the emphasis is going to be on what Sri Lanka itself is going to need to do from here to maximise its chances to exit from this in a decent in a decent way, um, both on the stabilisation, but also those deeper reforms that, as you say, have been difficult to achieve historically. But now, you know, now is the time when it's 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 it's, it's going to be most um, needed. And so the emphasis is very much on on those uh, those actions by Sri Lanka itself. But uh, let, let, let us uh, leave it there. Let me thank you all uh, on the panel for participating and contributing uh, your very insightful uh, comments. And to those uh, watching online, thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you again uh, for a future discussion.